Welcome to Smart Branding, a podcast dedicated to branding, naming, and domain names. I'm Tatiana Bonneau, and with my guests, we try to help you create and grow strong, memorable, and meaningful brands online. I believe time is one of our most precious assets, and so I want to thank you in advance if you decide to spend the next 30 minutes with us. I promise to do my best to make those worth it. Let's go! So I guess start with a little bit of background. Tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself and, and how you came to fa- found, um, I guess, used.com. Yeah, sure. So like to make a long story short, uh, you know, that was kind of an accident. Um, uh, I used to, as I mentioned before, I used to be a professional tennis player when I was a kid, but I've never gave, uh, given up, you know, studying even while traveling a lot. Um, uh, and when I decided to quit professional tennis, uh, it was a hard cho- choice for me as, uh, you know, when you put a lot of attention, a lot of effort to, you know, and mm. uh, kind of have a dream, but uh, I am really grateful uh, for the advice from my parents. And they told me that actually, you know, it's, there are just, I don't know, 20, 50 people who are Mm. very successful in, in say playing tennis. And there are like thousands and, you know, hundreds Mm. of thousands of people who are successful in, I don't know, like science, uh, like uh, investment banking, whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And actually another piece of advice (laughs) you'll be laughing by uh, actually Michael Jordan. Uh, When I was a kid, uh, they actually uh, published a film um i don't remember how like the title but that was a documentary film about michael and like he was telling his story and uh, back then he was visiting a lot of uh, high schools and talking to kids and saying exactly the same thing like guys use your sport uh um victories as a chance to get to a great high school Mm -hmm. Uh, to get like uh, you know some uh, invitation yeah education but uh, don't dream about like being just you know NBA play because there were I don't know 300 of them that's Mm -hmm. it yeah and that so I remember this I was I think 12 when I first seen the movie and um, yeah so when I quit Dennis, I actually I got a master's degree in physics and mathematics. I was studying in uh, mathematician uh, gymnasium, and uh, yeah, that actually I fell in love with science. And um, I got uh, I got an invitation for a PhD program to one of the best universities in the United States, but accidentally everything in my life was by accident, you know. <laughs> uh, I actually joined a hedge fund. I don't know, for some reason. Accidentally. <laughs> I mean, for some reason, investment bankers, they, uh, they hire a lot of uh, graduates from like technical um, mm-hmm. departments, like scientists, like, I don't know, math, applied math, math, physics, chemistry. Um, yeah, so... And back then I was waiting for the invitation for the papers, you know, to join to this PhD program because I was dreaming of it as well, but spending several months at uh, at trading desk. Mm. And when I got the invite, I was like, you know what? It it, it (laughs) sounds and it feels so exciting. I mean, like trading and um, my boss, they, they actually uh started to invite me to investment committees where they analyzed you know different classes of assets and i was the by far i guess the youngest uh and the only girl actually <laughs> so <laughs> I mean, like, everything was so exciting and uh, that was really interesting you know to so it wasn't it wasn't a gambling at all it was a like hedge fund and we had like very complex um, investment strategies, different classes of assets. And yeah, I fell in love with this. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to stay and do this job. And uh, actually I've done this for nearly 10 years. 
So wow. I've worked uh, in a hedge fund, I've worked in brokerage, and I've done different. Uh, so I had different positions like um, analytical and trading and uh, portfolio management. And uh, um, when I turned like 30 years old, I've realized that I burned out actually. <laughs> and I <then> realized, <laughs> yeah, that I want to create something like, you know, to create a value, not just trading, I don't know, air. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I think I, I, I get that. And anyway, you know, investment banking is a very aggressive uh, environment. It's mostly, yeah, still man's world. And, you know, it's really aggressive, especially when it uh, relates to, you know, bonuses and, you know, big mm. money. And I was exhausted. And uh, I just decided to quit. And I was thinking to maybe apply for MBA program, you know, just try to change the course of my career. And uh, I met I met a guy. Uh, he was uh, he is an engineer. He's a very talented engineer, and uh, he told me, "Okay, listen, you know a lot about money, and uh, I'm building a startup. Would you please help me to raise funds?" <laughs> I was like, "Okay," uh, and actually, he pitched me his idea. And frankly speaking, back then it was it was roughly six years ago. I knew nothing about venture. I, cause I was trading public assets and, uh, and frankly speaking, I knew nothing about the internet. So, okay. Uh, I read news online as everybody did. I use social networks like Facebook. Hmm. I think not maybe, yeah, maybe already a little bit of Instagram back then. But I knew not uh, like I knew nothing about internet and you know startups. So it took me nearly I would I would say roughly one year to you know to get kind of deep knowledge about the industry, mm. what venture, how to raise funds, you know what are what what are startups all about. And um, yeah, actually after one year we raised funds, and it nice. took me yeah it took me roughly two weeks. So I was lucky in a way because. Since then, I've raised several times, and every time, it's you know, it's a pain to be honest. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it took me. I would say it took me like eleven months to learn everything what I could about you know the whole thing, and then like a couple of weeks of meetings and you know raising first uh, round of investments. And uh, when I did it, uh, he invited me to join the the startup as a CEO and I actually I accepted this offer it was so exciting but again I couldn't even imagine what I'm signing up to so <laughs> I was like oh cool now I have 30% of the company it's like, great <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out that you know after several months he actually lost his uh, interest in the whole thing because uh, it was 2017 and you know blockchain was booming and actually he mm -hmm. launched a new startup he launched uh he launched actually a new company uh he launched um a, a new blockchain which is still i think in operations and there are a bunch of different um you know projects who migrated to this blockchain and he he was among the probably first i don't know 20 companies who who has done ico ico mm -hmm. but you know and it was also very tempting and he asked me to join but you know i was thinking okay i'm responsible in front of my team and i'm responsible in front in front of my investors and i cannot just you know quit and do something else i mean mm. this is i think this is probably a, like girlish thing i think <laughs> boy they're different okay this is more exciting let's go do this yeah <laughs> you know what i see when i'm talking and when i'm like communicating with the uh, male founders they're mm -hmm. they're totally different but i decided you know to pursue this first project uh, i joined and um that you know the project itself was in advertising it was an ad tech company 
and I spent nearly three years working in it before I found, you know, actually much bigger market pain in this industry. And that's how I actually um, launched views and already by myself. So I'm a solo mm-hmm. founder. All right. Yeah, because I saw you have some sort of science and then corporate background. And I was like, how did you get into ads? You know, that's more creative. And yeah, so I understand better now. <laughs> it's a fake, yeah. you know. <laughs> it's a fake. Yeah. How did you come up with the name? Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, you know, I was reading a book by Phil Knight, uh, A Shoe Dog, right? Yeah. Yeah. Knight. And, uh, yeah. And I, I remember especially, you know, this uh, chapter about how they actually ended up with swoosh and, you know, the name of the project and uh, the name of the company. And uh, uh, I actually back then I was based, uh, I, I was a part of a, um, a boot camp in New York where I met um where i met a girl and she was working on like branding and everything so and we started just to brainstorm on on the idea of a new project Mm -hmm. and uh uh which was like okay the first project was about new kind of uh mobile rich media ads so we Mm -hmm. were creating we called it like floating ad units uh, which appeared on top as an overlay uh, on different websites and applications, and you can actually mm-hmm. uh, move it around the screen. And it was it wasn't obtrusive, but it was very cool and attracted a lot of attention. And so, like new kind of rich media ads. And uh, I was still working on that idea, and we started to brainstorm with with her about like, okay, it's what are the major feature of this you know rich media it was it was always viewable like viewability and mm-hmm. back then it was uh, a big challenge for a lot of advertisers because they were talking a lot about fraud about you know banners blindness and this kind of things and i was thinking about okay viewable viewable viewability and actually used is viewable super tool all right uh, okay but, yeah. but then so i was playing around you know this words and then i was thinking okay it should be since you know phil knight was telling about okay it should be kind of short and um how to say like you know i was thinking about like google yahoo you know this mm-hmm, mm-hmm, thought and uh i i don't know like the sound is I don't even know how to describe it. So I was. You said about- the swoosh, swoosh, and it sounds like swoosh actually. So you said yeah. it, it's that one yeah, brief so kind was, of a no, name. On the top of my head, and I was like playing with it. And then there is another thing. Okay. First, you have, uh, you know, like the idea describing the major features of your solution, for instance, right? Mm-hmm. All the major pain points you're trying to solve with your solution. So this is one thing then so and you so i i I actually wrote a big list of different synonyms you know playing around this topic then there is another big thing okay sometimes like tweet right so Mm. so it's not exact uh you know word but it sounds Mm -hmm. like word so you start Mm -hmm. to play with you know you start playing this game okay maybe viewability but you know the spelling is different and then mm-hmm. there is much bigger challenge to find a free domain name mm-hmm. <laughs> this is a big one and to be honest used was actually uh was uh, wasn't free and you know usually you pay i don't know 100 dollars per 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 name right per do- domain name in in my case it was like i think 2500 and mm. uh, I didn't have money as a startup founder <laughs> but uh, they allowed me to pay uh, in installments like I think you know 12 installments so mm-hmm. I could afford this but so basically I was playing with these three um, things like pain point uh, pain points synonyms 
like, you know, spelling and sound and then domain name. Mm -hmm. No, you, you, you did a very smart thing. I think a lot of people, well, I, I can go on and on about mistakes that people do when naming, but a lot of people overlook one of those things that you mentioned and it, it's a mistake. And like, like you said, it makes a lot more sense to, to go with what makes sense, what completes all your criteria and get the matching domain name because otherwise you're just rendering all of your marketing less effective. That's, that's the case. Yeah, exactly. And I probably, you know, I was like in a way since uh, like right after this first uh, boot camp, I participated in a different one, which was uh, especially like creative kind of boot camp. And I was working in a team with uh, several people who are like copywriters and uh, the whole idea of this boot camp. So they invited startup founders on one hand and on the other hand, they invited like copywriters, designers, mm -hmm. like creators and uh, founders were paying for the whole thing. And then as far as I remember, it was like three day boot camp, and we had like five teams. And uh, at the end uh, we were pitching and the winner got some, you know, money, but for me so we didn't win and I came there with a different completely different project just you know to to you this opportunity and mm -hmm. being inside this process so I've learned a lot how like copywriter how designer how you know this spot smart and professional people were working and so basically it learned me it taught me a lot mm. no you, you sound like like you keep talking about boot camps and then courses and books and and you've changed already so many different activities. It, it, it like you sound super busy, but it, it seems very interesting and exciting. It's like I'm almost thinking, okay, what's going to be the next thing now that she's going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm thinking. Now I'm dreaming about like a, like building a unicorn, but not in a sense that you know I want to become famous and successful. No, mm -hmm. I uh, now like when you found a real mic market pain and like you see. Like how um, people in the industry suffer, you know, make it more efficient. It's just, you know, it's just a crazy thing. You want to bring this solution to as many people as possible because you see the real value. Mm. And uh, fun, finally, and finally, I feel like I found uh, like this. Uh, sweet spot where I want to be and what mm. I want to do and frankly speaking yeah like building a startup is a is a tough one but uh, I'm enjoying <laughs> yeah it is a rewarding experience definitely a tough one but it is rewarding I can totally relate to that and we, we we've been talking about like how you got to it and the name and we actually totally missed up I missed to to ask you what does views do actually what what yeah, do you do uh, the initial idea was to build, okay, so let's call it like Banner's factory. So when I was thinking about this idea, actually that was the, the time when Canva has started to boom. So Canva, mm -hmm. you know, what is Canva? I, I believe oh, yeah, yeah, we're using so, it, yeah. <laughs> so they, they added a feature to create a banner for social media, like Instagram and uh, Facebook. And mm -hmm. I, I guess like, 17 18 uh these were the years when all these influences you know started to actually to boom as well and it became extremely you know popular and it became like a real new niche for mm -hmm. you know young professionals to make money and uh i was working with like big agencies and big brands uh in in eight countries back then including like uh united states canada and also like african and european countries and uh i remember you know i was listening to sebastian tomish who is still back then and still is a head of uh, global advertising uh at new york times and he was telling about the you know big market pain so in the in the industry there are a lot of data right and brands mm. obtain a lot of data but they don't leverage it mm -hmm. and they have channels to deliver very personalized ads but the biggest problem is actually production because it's still manual you have a mm. lot of design you have creative agencies 
uh, on one hand, on the other hand, you have a lot of data. So you ideally want to create not like five messages, five quarters, mm -hmm. but and five designs. But you ideally want to create, I don't know, 500,000 designs and quarters, mm -hmm. right? And then there are different channels and like, I don't know, like Facebook, Instagram, Google, and all mm. this channel, many more, and all this channel, they have different technical requirements. So it's not the mm -hmm. same image, different sizes, mm -hmm. different, like technical requirements, and it's still manual. So everything else in the industry is automated, but production is still manual. And so we started to think, okay, we probably need to think about something like Canva, but for ads in general, because Canva is for designs, any kind mm -hmm. of design, right? Like mm -hmm. that, I don't know, images and cards and whatever and we should uh, create kind of canva but specifically for ads and then mm -hmm. i think after several months figma started to boom and figma actually solved another big problem uh, figma brought together designers and developers mm -hmm. and now developers could see like the ui ux components in real time ask question in the mm. same kind in canvas and like brought together two completely separate group of professionals and we started to think okay uh actually ads is about creative people and media media buying mm -hmm. and that's how we we thought okay maybe we should create something which is kind of an overlap between canva and figma but for digital ads mm -hmm. and uh, then our idea evolved from simply like Banner's factory, like, you know, mm -hmm. a tool that you can quickly create from scratch and edit. We added kind of, you know, features related to project management when creative mm -hmm. and media people uh, meeting together in the same team on the same project uh, on the canvas and can command in real time and share, you know, this projects and streamline directly to the ad accounts without need to mm -hmm. download. Upload. So I would say, so some, yeah, some users still call us like Figma for digital ads or Canva for digital ads. <laughs> yeah, basically bringing together designers and marketers and help them um, stream, like scale versioning, streamline approvals, and to solve, I would say the biggest problem, go live faster. Because currently mm. they face with lots of delays in campaign launch, yeah, um, that as you were speaking, I had like flashbacks because I was I was doing programming like from ages ago, I would say 15 years ago. And then I had an IT company before I completely got out of that and got more into the marketing side. But like, as you were saying, you know, there's the designers, and the programmers, and I had flashbacks of those horrible moments where like you would spend, you know, hours with the designers in one room and talk about how amazing that is and you go out so excited and it's like brilliant and you go to the program it's like they're like no 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 no, no. there's just no chance that is not going to happen not at that budget not that time not that and it's like oh jesus okay we're back to zero so yeah and then you throw into the mix also like you you said the the other side you know the the buying advertising and all of that management so uh, yeah i can show specific value in connecting all that in the speed that would add to the pr process. Yeah. Right. I think we have you there. We have some delay in the connection, I think. I, I can hear you very well. Oh, OK. Yeah, I had some uh, delays. There was like there was hanging. I, I just came back from holiday and I had months of traveling and bad Internet. So I, I think as soon as like there's a moment of silence, I'm like, oh, no, the Internet is breaking in. It's OK. <laughs> Where are you? What was... Sorry. Oh, I'm in France. Yeah, that's OK. I'm in France. Oh, you in France. Me too. Where? where really? Yes. Oh, I'm in Nice. <laughs> you know, we're like, hey, <laughs> where yeah. are you in France? Wow, you know, I've just spent uh, like several weeks in Cannes uh, visiting oh, really? my friend. Yeah, but I'm in Paris. <laughs> I thought nice. you were in States. Funny. No, no, no. I mean, no. I mean, Nice. We've been traveling over the summer. We actually we were in the Alps. The last place we were was in the Alps, and we came back uh, Friday, I think, yeah, a few days ago. 
Amazing. Yeah. Okay. Maybe maybe you have a chance like to meet in person one day. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Let me know if you if you're around. I mean, Cannes is not far from here, but yeah, I'll also go to my my husband is from Paris, so we we visit sometimes as well. Okay. Yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, I'm not gonna try to not take much more of your time. If you, I guess. What are you because you, you you have those different backgrounds and experiences and you've been talking to a lot of founders and VCs as well and what would you say are the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make when it comes to generally startups and in more particular in branding and naming? Oh loaded question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a hard question because you know. Okay, this is my second attempt, you know, to build stuff. To be honest, in the first project, I'm... Hello. Yeah, I'm oh, connection. Yeah, you lost me? I can... I can uh, you're second. back, you're back. Yeah, so, like, as I mentioned, you know, this is my second startup, and uh, while working the first one, I've done all possible mistake, mistakes. <laughs> related to you know to everything to operations to branding to like to sales to literally everything and you know it's it's difficult i think you know probably it's a good it's a it's um it's a good idea to join kind of you know a creative boot camp to work with professionals i know that i know that you know for a startup uh cash is the king and you know it's never enough money and you know it's uh very difficult to find resources to invest into branding but it's on the other hand it's very important uh there is a saying like how you uh how you call the boat right mm. something like that mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how it sails mm -hmm. so um yeah maybe there is uh, maybe uh in the place where you are but after you know the covid there were a lot of online you know kind of boot camps and programs and i would suggest to join and to learn from professionals you know what are the most important things to work in because you know again for instance, views became viral in uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, I never thought of going to this, you know, market because it's completely different in terms of business culture and everything. Mm -hmm. But in viral just because of our identity, because of our name and logo. And, wow. uh, yeah, that was oh, that was fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that was the fascinating spirit for for our team. So that's why it is very important and uh uh you know we have a logo chameleon mm -hmm. yeah. and when i was thinking about it so on one hand you know many advisors keep saying like okay you work with uh corporations with like uh enterprises you need to be more serious mm -hmm. but i still kind of resist it i say okay they are also people <laughs> yeah and exactly i love the story of mailchimp so i've read mm -hmm. i've read this book how they created this you know this character and basically this character was a like was a force for them you know to become mm. viral and uh, this is also a good example so i think there is no secret sauce it's just you know read more and join some programs where you can learn from professionals uh, who know, guess, maybe, yeah. who, you know you know about this story about this branding story sure and i guess to an extent there's always like there's a number of mistakes that you just have to make yourself to to exactly. you know get over them and to learn so there's no other way around that as well and that's yeah, not so, yeah yeah so you're i i think that you're totally right and you don't have to be afraid of you know making these mistakes it's your game, it's your rules, and you can always change them. So, okay, mm. if you start a project and you feel that something doesn't work, just people just, you know, mm. work and, and create something different. I don't know, naming, logo, whatever. Mm. Yeah, I think it was my husband, that was yesterday, and he said he'll send it to me. He came across some article about 
some like very old brands like Nokia and Siemens and whatever, and even older and what they launched as what they were doing. And there were some like crazy things that you wouldn't expect at all, like the toilet paper or I don't know, pens or yeah. whatever. Like, it's like, what <laughs> they were doing, what? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> I yeah, mean, you no, don't, I, yeah, yeah, you don't create a brand that lasts over centuries without changing. That's a given. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Last question from is what's next for you? What What are you up to now? What's exciting? Uh, okay. So we are, we've just started to sell the solution into brands. So mm -hmm. we see like. Uh, how the market is uh, evolving so for probably for a decade or maybe a couple of decades uh it was uh you know it was a job for creative and media agencies and these days mm -hmm. brands want to bring this e-house i mean they want to control the quality and the scale and they start building in-house teams to work on creatives and i'm not talking about like something you know huge like uh creative strategy but i'm talking about like small things like execution like banners mm -hmm. and uh we see this trend has just started to evolve and uh, we are following the trend so we've just started to sell into brands and we have just signed up our first french uh, custom nice. actually big company yeah we, and we are all very excited about this and uh, yeah, so I think this is a new stage for our startup, you know, monetizing this uh, B2B connections. And uh, yeah, we are very excited. <laughs> That's good. That's great. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm, I always lie about the last question in the interview. Sorry, I don't mean to, but as you were talking, you know, you said you, you're now starting to work with brands directly. Um, who can use Fused? Well, what is what is the type of company? Is there some size, for example, that's too small or too big or type of industry or whatever? Uh, you know, we have actually, and since uh, I'm currently based in France, because, you know, I moved from New York, we, we've done localization of our solution into French, so you can work okay. in, in French and Fused. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just, you know, good thing to mention. And uh, initially our like early adopters were i would say small brands and solo marketers so for instance you know we have like some agencies and uh, resellers who are like for instance reseller of a coffee machine from switzerland so usually mm -hmm. these are small teams and actually they don't have like a lot of resources to hire expensive agencies and this is an ideal solution for them because we use this very flexible and it lets you to create really great pieces without even uh being a like super professional in so you might be a marketer not like a specific designer but a marketer and mm -hmm. you can do everything used one thing then we we started to experience more uh like bigger brands for instance we are piloting with like Galerie Lafayette and you know some other really big brands who do have budget for like creative agencies and media agencies but anyway they control the process they uh, give the final approval to the creative mm -hmm. and you know they actually set the campaign goals so they want to see everything and uh, used as ideal solution for such you know, big brands who probably doesn't do anything in-house, but they control everything. They see mm -hmm. everything in real time and they can communicate. And then with every participant of the campaign uh, launch. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, agencies, uh, they started to actually come into views. But I would say our ideal uh, clients are mostly like, media teams not creative teams but media teams mm -hmm. because you can a creative agency prepared the strategy and the idea and the assets and then media teams actually invest their time and money into like buying traffic and mm -hmm. uh, working the performance and they see okay probably we need to change a background we need to change a copy or we need to create another variation and this is a very simple task but mm -hmm. uh, 
before we used, you had to go to creative mm. team them wait for a couple of weeks because they are yeah. overloaded with a lot of other tasks oh, now, yeah. they, now they can easily change it themselves and yeah. get instant approval from like chief designer for instance like okay guys it looks good you can take this mm. and keep working on a b testing on performance so i would say that media teams are our ideal customers but then they start to bring creative people as well <laughs> <laughs> wow so that's yeah i mean it, it sounds so logical and useful what you're saying i'm like how did people live without that before i don't know which is a good thing <laughs> yeah yeah i guess that that's the that's that's probably how you can tell you know a good idea from a not so great one when you have that feeling of because you, you mentioned canva for example and when it first came along, I was like, yeah, okay, it can do some things, but you know, I, I, I would still go to the designer or use Photoshop or use whatever. And now I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I would do without it. Like yeah, just exactly. us as a team, not just me personally. So, yeah. Because they have evolved as well to, um, th that's the other thing. They, they were in a niche where they were needed, but they have developed and evolved as well around all of their users as they were coming. So that's, that's important as well. Yeah, that's true. Great. All right. I think that that's it. That's wrap. <laughs> it's, it's been a pleasure. I'm not going to hold you up for much longer. And definitely if, if you're around, uh, or I mean, if, if we come to Paris, probably in October, actually.